Hey, puppy trades. I wanted to do a, let me make sure the echo is not too loud. Last time I tried to film, the echo was a little loud. I'm not one of those, you know, despite what some people say. I'm not one of those fancy YouTubers. Um, you know, I'm not the best with technology. And I'm trying to get um, better with my presentations. Um, you know, I got PowerPoint and, uh, you know, I really want to show you guys, um, you know, I think I want to do like get my filmmaking a little better, you know, um, that's not goal number one, you know, but that's just what it takes, right? You know, I do think a lot of these other guys on Finchwit, you know, they, uh, they got better, you know, graphics than me. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, now that my investing is getting a little more, um, the, the system, I'm, I'm really liking the, the progress of the system that I've built. Um, and the best part is that most of it, um, is based on, uh, income from dividends and covered call ETFs. Um, so that's kind of the whole philosophy behind dividend growth. Um, one is that, you know, ideally it gets, you know, for dividend growth stocks, you know, that have the two to three to percent, you know, 4% growing yields, the high payout ratios, you know, Johnson and Johnson's and, you know, Pepsi's and Nike's and Starbucks's and JP Morgan's and you know, st stocks like that. One reason, you know, Merck, right? Um, a lot of the healthcare names, those big healthcare winners, you know, the stability and the quality of their growing, you know, dividend, that high payout ratio, um, you know, kind of in hindsight forecasted that they were going to be big, big winners. Um, uh, and a lot of that is, you know, based on the idea that, the dividends growing um and it's you know because it's being reinvested and because it's being paid out um one for tax purposes it's a lot more efficient than you know taking the short-term capital gains but also um you know the investor doesn't have to game the market right and when they retire you know um their retirement isn't based on um when you know we're in a bull or not right um because they're instead of withdrawing four percent of the principal they're just receiving that three to four percent dividend yield right that's kind of you know the thought process and then what i also you know like is we have this you know new emerging world of covered call etfs i'm certainly going to be buying this one soon um clip k-l-i-p uh, selling, uh, running the buy right on KWeb. So um, this is only paid four or five dividends, just like Tesla, just like OARK came out at the beginning of the year. Not a lot of fun history, um, you know, but I, I do know what the buy right is and I'm going to be investing in this because KWeb um, is an ETF full of Chinese tech stocks. One, you know, I really like Chinese tech. Um, and I'm interested in investing in it. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do is I'm going to buy about 60% clip, 65% clip in, you know, 30, 35, 40% K-Web. Uh, and I'm just going to reinvest it. And if the dividends, this is a huge if, um, if right now this is paying a dollar per share um, per month, uh, it, you know, just below 20, you know, a share. So it's only paid four dividends, right? But um, the kind of, if that was an annualized yield and they kept that up, um, this is paying about 50 or 60%. If I merged it with KWeb, um, you know, I could get that yield down to about, you know, 40, 45, even, you know, 35% um, and reinvest it in KWeb. What I like about covered call, uh, or reinvested in that basket, um, you know, and also other, you know, funds I invest in. So um, anyway, that's all to say that a lot of um, my, my big focus and certainly, you know, um, going to be the
the biggest source of income is from dividends and um, yields from, you know, ETFs that run the covered call strategy and on various, you know, sectors. Um, and a small part of what I do, you know, when I think the best time to position um, into that, you know, is, you know, I would say about 15 to 20 percent at most, you know, is based on my technical bias where I think we're going. Now, that's just um, one kind of, you know, one kind of aspect of technicals is my bias, right? I also know what the bears think, right? The bear is obviously, you know, always great to get into what they think. The bears are going to say, um, this is a ABC correction from the all time high. Um, so this was, they're probably going to say wave A, wave B, um, and they're going to look for wave C to begin, or they're going to say, this is wave A. And if we go higher, the, this, they're just going to keep calling this wave B um, and look for this wave C, right? And they're going to have us going to at least the lower 300s um, for this kind of ABC idea, right? Um, so this is an aspect of tentacles is knowing what the Elliott Wave Bears think, right? It's not just about my bias, right? You know, I, what, what do I think is going to happen, right? And then what, what do they think is going to happen? Um, and, and the most important part is how am I prepared to call this bluff, right? That's that's the most important thing. Uh, nothing else is possible besides that, right? Um, or, or without that, you know, nothing else is, is really possible. The technical bias is, you know, the technical analysis is, is going to be trash if I'm not prepared for wave C, um, you know. And also... Um, you know, if, if the approach is only technical, if the approach is only technical, you know, based off of gaming a, a rally or gaming a, a short, then the income that's being received is going to be very sporadic. And that's kind of um, that's why most people have to have discords. They have to have subscription services, because even if you are actually good at, you know, trading the market you know, you, you know, make, it's, it's not like you're going to, um, catch the big winner, you know, the market's been in a, you know, if you go to finviz.com, you know, it just kind of objectively, objectively shows the market's kind of been converging into a triangle for a long time. I mean, really some say even from this, you know, level, we've been, you know, consolidating, but in the very least, you know, from what would the, the triangle people, they would draw something like this. I mean, the market objectively just looked like this. And this is August 2022. That's, you know, this uh, October um, 2022, right? I mean, if the focus hasn't been on premium collection and dividend collection, then where were where were the, the the bill payments coming from during this time, right? The only other answer is that someone's trading with an a, extreme amount of leverage, or they're trading with very short term options, right? Which is what I sell. So you know, clearly, I'm not a fan of those, right? And that's why people have discords and and services. So at a certain point, it, it just kind of has to be based on you know premium collection and income and what i do is i use etfs like psq which inverses the nasdaq sh which inverses the s p um and also one of my favorites is this metaverse etf this is you know just kind of that big tech those sexy you know tech stocks they call it the metaverse etf this is a tech etf with a you know a growth kicker but it's, you know, NVIDIA, Apple, the Metaverse, uh, Meta, that stupid freaking name, Meta. Maybe when I finally start, stop calling it Facebook and start calling it Meta, that's when it, you know, hits an all-time high. Roblox, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, but really besides Roblox, this is a tech ETF. And I'm pretty sure these two NAs right here, I think they're Sony, and I think it's another foreign stock. I'm not sure which one. But anyway, that's a t it's a tech ETF. So if I look at this beta. The beta is 1.38, so I'm going to reach for 
my phone. I already did this math. If you go to volatility in, in Greeks, um, the delta for these options. Um, so I'll, I'll, let's just talk about two option positions I own, kind of how I prepare for that wave C, right? The bears think SPY is going to go, going to go on a wave C, uh, down to the low 300s, right? So how am I prepared for that, right? Well, I have, um, you know, similar positions to what I'm about to describe on SH and PSQ, uh, ETFs that short the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. So I, I have, uh, calls and puts on those ETFs. So if the market crashes, the calls are going to go, you know, up as much as the market crashes, right? Ideally, um, you know, it's an inverse ETF is going to, there's, you know, other aspects to it, you know, over a very long period of time, that negative one X, you know, ETF is going to decay, right? So if the market does rally, since I have puts on those ETFs as well, if the market rallies significantly and the NASDAQ goes to the moon, the S&P goes to the moon, PSQ is going to dump, SH is going to dump, and I have puts on the, those ETFs as well. So the, the decay would help me help me in a, in a situation like that, which is good, right? But anyway, let's focus on the metaverse ETFs just because it's not, um, just because it's not leveraged. Um, so if we look at METV, I can go to volatility in Greeks, I can go to these expirations, and I can go, I have the 11 put and the 10 call um, for the August expiration and um, the November expiration. Now, I have other options on this ETF as well um, that I've gone into, but I'm just going to focus on those two, um, you know, sets of options in this position. The 11 call, oh, sorry, the 11 put, the 11 put and the 10 call for the August and the November expiration. So we can, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, how much downside exposure I'm getting and just how I'm calculating it. So if I go to the 11 put, I can see it has a delta of 71. So I bought um, these for 275. So since there's, a, it's important to note that when, when an in the money put and an in the money call, or, well, When there's when there's a distance between when there's an in the money distance between um, the strike prices, right? So I have the eleven put and the ten call. So there's a hundred dollar difference, but th there's a one dollar difference. But in option pricing terms, that's a hundred dollars of of what what would be called a window. So there's an in the money window. So even though I paid two seventy five, in reality, I'm only risking a hundred seventy five dollars. Uh, for for these two positions, because um, because there's a hundred dollar window, right? So even at the expiration, if we hit max decay um, on those ETFs, um, and the ETF closed right between ten point you know ten and eleven, right? So if it closed at ten point fifty, I hit max decay, I would still have a hundred dollars of intrinsic value. Um, cause there's a $1 difference between 11 and 10, right? It's a long way of saying that. So really, even though I paid 275, it's only costing me 175. Now let's calculate the, um, exposure for this August, ET August ETF. And I bought this a while ago. I think I bought this, um, a lot earlier in the year. So I've been able to, um, collect a lot of dividends, reinvest a lot of dividends, um, against this deep in the money put. And so the idea is that the dividends coming in are creating a net credit. Now to calculate the exposure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, the Delta right here um, uh, of the put, which is 71. So uh, the options market, according to the bar chart is saying there's a 71% chance uh, that this $11 put is going to expire in the money. So that would make sense because the metaverse ETF is currently at 9.06. So I'm going to do 71 and I'm going to multiply it by 9.06. What I get is $643. So I get $643 in downside exposure. But remember, this is hedging mostly a dividend collecting basket that ideally has um, an average beta of one or lower, right? So if I'm, um, you know, the, the stock market has a beta of one. 
this ETF has a beta of 1.38. So to calculate my hypothetical downside exposure, I'm not just going to take um, 71 times uh, 9.06, which is 643. I'm then going to multiply 643 by... Um, Sorry, I just had a blonde moment. I'm going to multiply 643 by 1.38 because of that's the beta of the ETF. So that gets $887. So this position um, that I only paid $175 for is giving me $887 in downside exposure to the market. Now, if the market crashes, the delta is only going to get bigger um, and bigger. Now, it gets a little... It's a little misleading with this ETF uh, right now because um, if the Metaverse ETF goes and crashes all the way to, you know, one or zero, realistically, there's going to be a re reverse stock split. OK, um, and so that would mean that my op my put option is going to get um, made whole um, because they're going to have to make the 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 underlying stock price higher by a certain ratio, right? In, in this ridiculous bear scenario where the stock market crashes 70%, um, I'm literally prepared for that, right? If the Metaverse ETF keeps going all the way down to one, um, that 11 put makes money every dollar down, every penny down. Uh, the delta gets bigger and bigger. Um, and I have multiple of these positions, right? So if we go to November, it's the same calculation. Doesn't even really make sense to do it again. Um, but it would be 67 for the Delta is what I would use. So th that was all just to kind of introduce that most of what I'm doing is um, a qual it, it is quantitative. Uh, most of what I'm doing is not uh, is based on collecting more income from premium and dividends than is being paid out. No, the reason that I paused there is because I had a little bit of uh, I forgot to calculate um, the call upside exposure. So I am getting a little bit of call upside exposure, not not too much right now. So um, I have um, a lot of um, different positions on this ETF. But for this specific, specific uh, position, if I take um, the call delta of 10, uh, the 10 call delta is uh, 28. So I can take 28 and I can multiply it um, by uh, 9.06, and that gets 253. If I multiply it by 1.38 for the beta, then that call position is giving me $350 in upside exposure, and that is also only going to get higher and higher if the Metaverse ETF uh, goes up more and more. So the reason, uh, if I, if I add the call um, e exposure and the put exposure, I'll do 350 plus, I think it was 880 something. So 350 plus 880, in theory, this um, long gamma position is giving me uh, $1,230 in exposure um, to, you know, the metaverse sector, right? And I only paid $175 for it. So that's kind of, you know, I can now collect, um, you know, in theory, I could invest $880 in kind of a um, lower beta basket, a dividend collecting um, basket against this ETF. Um, and just, just for this one put, and I could collect dividends against that. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind it. Anyway, here is SPY. What I think is going to happen, given all that, is that this is a large wave one and an ABC wave two correction. If I take the length of wave one, place it at wave two low, then that super long term ridiculous invalidation that's not very useful is 348. Um, to say wave two is already ended, we can go the length of wave one, place it at the wave two low, and that equal X target would take SPY all the way up uh, above 600. Uh, for wave three. So if we kind of zoom in a lot of these um, 
you know, tech stocks have done, or <laughs> SPY is basically a tech stock, unfortunately. Um, but a lot of these, you know, NASDAQ related, you know, the Microsofts and, um, you know, the Googles and, you know, the NASDAQ, they've done one, two, three, four, five waves, um, you know, and so in the, the bigger picture of Elliott wave, the bulls are going to use that as evidence that an impulse is formed from this low, at least um, in the long term picture. Now, what the real argument is, is from this low, is it not one, two, three, four, five? Is it actually wave one, wave two, and then another wave one, and another wave two, and we're going to see SPY enter wave three of wave three? from the low. So that's the real kind of debate. Now, there's a way to know um, in the future from an Elliott Wave perspective, right? There's a way to know, right? This is all just my technical bias that I get to do because I'm prepared for, um, you know, the super crash, because I'm prepared for, um, you know, super choppy markets, you know, a long sideways period. Now I get to prepare for what I think is actually going to happen uh, that we're going to start to see, you know, a rally uh, unfold and we're going to see the pace of the market, you know, really change. So if we have wave one, wave two, another wave one, another wave two, we can look or I'm going to look for SPY to enter wave three of wave three. Now, the point that I'm going to get to in the future is that if we look at Microsoft and the NASDAQ, it's already kind of done what I'm saying I'm going to wait for SPY to do, but really... Um, I think SPY, you know, has a lot of leading indicators that it's going to do it as well. So what I'm referring to is in Elliott Wave, there's a rule that says wave five must end with momentum divergence, right? So um, right now, there is momentum divergence. What the bears are going to say, this is one, two, three, four, five ways up. So at the bare minimum, they're going to look for a correction um, to say this is wave one. That's wave two. So bears... Are going to say they're going to look for a daily correction but really they're going to actually be looking for a long-term um a b c correction uh to start unfolding um so that would be if it was one two three four five waves up the bears are going to say wave five is ending we're going to have um one two three four five waves in wave one so they're going to say you know we're supposed to be looking for a wave two correction at least on the daily chart now what i'm going to get into is that there's a rule in Elliott wave theory that says wave five must end with momentum divergence. So if we look at the daily RSI, if SPY keeps rallying, you know, let's say SPY gets up to the 420s, right? And we see this daily RSI go from 52.96 to um, above 69.21, that's going to confirm, quote unquote, from an Elliott Wave perspective, it's not one, two, three, four, five waves, you know, correction. It's wave one, wave two, wave one, wave two, wave three of wave three being entered from the low. So let's talk about some other kind of tech stocks that look like they're doing that. Doing that. So the idea would be if SPY does rally and the daily RSI gets above 69.21, it would confirm this is one, two, one, two, wave three of wave three, not one, two, three, four, five, correction, okay? So that's the, the main idea. The point is, looking at Microsoft, looking at Google, they've already done that with their RSIs, right? It's the very, it's a very similar, I mean, Microsoft is in a, a, a league of its own right now. It's, it's way ahead of, you know, that that spy kind of analog but <clears throat> if we look at um microsoft right here um that that same question was posed you know not not too long ago that same question was posed all the way back in march is this uh one two one two wave three of wave three or is it one two three four five so we're supposed to look for a wave two correction microsoft's daily rsi broke above um, this high, right? So <laughs> this is going to seem silly, but let's, let's just do this with the RSI, right? So the question was, was, is it one, two, three, four, 
for so the idea is that when Microsoft broke this high for a very brief moment the question was is this one two three four five Microsoft is gonna make a new high with momentum divergence is what the bears were going to argue its relative strength index broke above the wave three high right it already broke above it um, so once it broke above it that confirmed from an Elliott wave perspective it, it's not one two three four five wave one and then we correct it's one two one two wave three of wave three began and we we did see a big old wave three of wave three um, begin right so now this this is probably um, an unfolding um, and you know I, I'm not going to subdivide that live that you know maybe I'll post about that um, we're seeing you know some of these start to need that you know daily subdivision but what in the bigger picture the whole point is that Microsoft kind of did what we're wondering right now is, is spy going to do right this is all from a technical perspective from an Elliott wave theory um, perspective right this is all in the bigger context that most of what I'm doing is based on collecting premium and being prepared for this scary crash at, at all times right that's what we saw is necessary in 2020 you know we, we have to be prepared for the scary crash at all times um, just because if, if all the money is in the Roth if all the money is in the 401k well that's all tracking the market that's all tracking spy right so if they right they right the new world order the whatever right the people who control the market right the reason you're watching this video is because you don't think that the stock market is is run um <laughs> by a random walk free market of you know individual buyers and sellers but you know that people from w began to wyckoff for a hundred years have said no it's con controlled by a few large operators and they clearly work in tandem with the media and kind of contrive you know all the the reasons quote unquote that the, the prices are moving right so retail is always like oh we're we're supposed to be reacting to news like that's all you know in my opinion a waste of time right so when they crash the market if all my money is in a Roth or the stock market and it's all down and then they say, hey, you know, we're going to take away your biggest source of income, your employer or your your small business you own. Right. We're going to close your small business. You know, we're going to tell your employer we're going to fine you uh, where we're going to find them over ten thousand dollars if you don't comply with some, you know, ridiculous mandate that's going to get stricken down in court you know, a month after it comes out of the president's mouth. Um, if I'm not, I have to be ready to call the bluff. I have to be ready for sideways. I don't want my money to come from speculation on, you know, that that's called speculative finance. And there is a place for that. And I do use that. Um, you know, I invest in uh, individual stocks like Tesla and Alibaba and Enphase Energy and Camping World and Simon Property Group and Starbucks and, you know, Litecoin and Bitcoin and um, <laughs> that sounds like I'm just, you know, you know, all in growth right there, you know, and, and the point is not for me to list all my holdings. I, I list, you know, I have a lot of individual funds I've been investing in uh, recently, SCHD, uh, SPYG, so SCHD is that Charles Schwab dividend ETF, SPYG um, is uh, the S&P 500 growth ETF. Um, you know, and, you know, a lot of uh, individual uh, SPHQ, um, the kind of high quality, um, you know, a quality filter on the S&P um, I've invested in recently um, and uh, SPHB, which filters the S&P 500 for high beta stocks just to get that, you know, kind of oomph to the upside if the market gets running. Um, that was a little bit of a tangent, uh, and it's definitely not, you know, uh, all encompassing, all encompassing view of my, you know, portfolio. It was just to, you know, say that there is a place for, you know, technical bias, right? There is a place for speculative finance, but that's, um, you know, that's not what's gonna pay, you know, rents and mortgages, you know, for decades, right? That's, you know, that that 
is what dividends are for. That's what, you know, you know, covered call uh, premium is for, right? But there is a place for, you know, the speculative finance. And right now, the big question is on the daily chart, is this one, two, three, four, five, or is it one, two, one, two, wave three of wave three? Technically, I'm supposed to be waiting for this daily RSI to break 69.21. Um, Microsoft has already kind of acted as a, le as a leading indicator uh, that that's going to happen. Uh, Google also, in my opinion, uh, has acted as a leading indicator that that's going to happen um, as well. Uh, you know, if we look at this right now, one, two, one, two, wave three of wave three. Um, and we've seen this, this RSI now break above the one, two, three, four. So bears were looking for this, um, bears were looking for this to end wave five right here. And they were looking for this to be a lower high on the RSI with a higher high. And it, it wasn't, um, from an Elliott wave perspective, it's not because the relative strength index is, has broken to a new high. And there's a rule in Elliott wave theory that says, uh, wave five must end with momentum divergence. That's all to say that this suggests Google is not one, two, three, four, five waves. And I'm supposed to look for a, you know, a large wave one to end in a, in a correction. It's one, two, one, two, a wave three of wave three, uh, has been entered. Uh, and we can see this kind of impulse, um, you know, unfold. Uh, unlikely that in the longer term, the stock market would be crashing uh, during that time. You know, Tesla, um, you know, a similar, you know, reason, you know, I'm bullish. Um, the, you know, it's a similar kind of, you know, NASDAQ kind of tech related name, not as big of a holding uh, in the S&P 500. Um, I think this is a large wave in the big picture. This, I think, is all a large wave one in a wave two. Um, so I'm looking for a massive wave three to begin in the long term, right? Uh, I own Tesla, I own Enphase Energy, and I also own Tesla and OARK that sell covered calls um, on Tesla and um, ARK. And now I'm going to add um, Clip, K-L-I-P, um, that sells covered calls on Chinese tech. So I'm getting that kind of high growth, um, that kind of high growth, uh, you know, tech exposure, Um and so for, for covered calls in case, you know, we keep, you know, being in a bear um, and then I'll, I'll be able to reinvest the dividends. I'll be able to reinvest the dividends um, in, you know, whatever funds and ETFs I'd like against the, you know, massive hedges that I'm going to have uh, specifically on the metaverse ETF, that growth ETF. Uh, we saw the metaverse ETF, you know, crash from, you know, nine to five or nine to four you know, in a, you know, big dramatic, you know, 20% correction in the market, um, that those, the 11 puts I have, um, the 10 puts I have and the positions I have on S H and uh, PSQ, not to mention AT&T and AG&C, um, and ET, um, would, would be huge. Uh, you know, th those puts on the metaverse would be massive and I could buy against those puts, um, and, and keep reinvesting what would also uh, likely be very high uh, implied volatility. So I'd be getting large premiums from the covered call ETFs in theory too, that I could reinvest in destroyed share prices, right? So that's kind of uh, the doomsday plan. I'm excited for the doomsday plan, but it's not my bias. I think that um, we're going to see this is one, two, three, four, five waves for Tesla, wave one, and ABC correction wave two. Um, you know, the bull kind of horn dream is that you know spy enters wave three of wave three tesla enters wave one wave two wave three the length of wave one place at the wave too low you know can take tesla all the way up into you know the 260s the 270s the idea is the abc correction ended where the length of wave a place at the wave b high uh, was where wave c was met uh, in phase energy i bought um it's looking uh, i think that in phase energy are going to follow uh, first solar, the Enphase Energy and Tesla are going to follow first solar. Um, you know, the setup, uh, you know, a few quarters ago was that first solar was going to enter a wave three, a wave three, uh, that looked very pretty. Um, I think that, uh, it, it's gotten a lot of confirmation that we're going to see, you know, some of that money flow into, um, other members of this kind of solar EV, you know, tech, um, 
you know, ESG, not EV sector, uh, the clean energy sector. Um, I think Enphase Energy is a wave one and a wave two. And I think this is another wave one and another wave two. Um, ending that wave two, the 78.6% retracement, uh, this wave one subdivided into one, two, three, four, five waves, wave one, wave two, wave three, the length of wave one place is way too low, uh, could take Enphase Energy all the way up to uh, the 370s and even beyond. My plan is to sell half my Enphase Energy position um, when uh, we see um, when uh, Enphase Energy hits the uh, 370s. Okay, so this is a first solar. Um, I think this is a large wave one and wave two, another wave one and another wave two. And yes, I said it's another wave one and another wave two. The crazy wave three of wave three happened. Um, you know, they don't all play out. And the, the whole, you know, kind of point at the beginning of this video is that uh, I don't want it to be based on, you know, them playing out. But what I want to objectively ask is, do, do other people have hits like this, right? Because everyone has misses. Everyone has misses. And, and this isn't the only one. Um, you know, I, I had, I, I did this with half the NASDAQ, um, in 2020 and 2021. Okay. Um, I did this with half the crypto crypto market in 2020 and 2021. Okay. I did this, um, with, um, you know, and, and, you know, and there are ones that don't play out. Those are the misses. Okay. But the hits, you know, the hits dispute the random walk. The hits, you know, what I did with oil, what I did with, you know, crypto, what I'm about to do with crypto again, what I've done with Tesla about three times, what I might do with Tesla again, what I've done with Enphase Energy, what I've done with the NASDAQ, what I'm about to do with the NASDAQ again, what I'm about to do, what I just did the first solar, um, what could happen to you know i mean a lot of that's what what has happened the hits this is why you know this is why i kind of get under under some people's skin because the hits dispute the random walk what i've done with pfizer i mean what i've done you know looking at i i, I i'm showing you what they're buying in the options market you know, before, and I'm like, they're, they're, they're buying long gamma. I said they were buying long gamma positions on oil and using the uh, new variant PSYOP uh, to buy against the bloated puts and that the oil was about to explode and we were going to, and that all happened. And what it, the, the oil hits, all the oil hits were just like this. The entire oil sector was just like this. Okay. Pfizer was just like this. Bitcoin and Ethereum and the NASDAQ were just like this. But all the oil hits were just like this. All of them. Okay? And what, what did the media tell you caused that? And how many, how many people's lives did that affect with what they said the explanation was? You know? And I'm saying step for step for step, what's going to happen to XLE and Occidental Petroleum and ExxonMobil and Chevron? And how they're going to explode out, out of these grand super cycle one two one two one two wave three of wave three. Okay. They're not all explained by earnings. And they're not all explained. You know. By partnerships and acquisitions. You know. So some of them are explained by things that really affect people's lives. And so if the hits bother you because it disputes the random walk, you know, I think you need to think about that. I think you need to think about the people who have been lied to about the required reserves ratio being 0% as the, the reason that inflation has exploded. And that I, I have proved and have documented that large institutions were taking financial positions in oil stocks that were delta neutral before a correction happened that made implied volatility spike um, and scared retail that was blamed on a scary variant that you don't give a shit about anymore. 
okay? And they said that after that, when I said they're buying all these oil stocks against these bloated puts, the oil sector is about to explode. Oxy is about to explode. Exxon Mobil is about to explode, right? What would they say really caused that to happen? A war, you know? All these scary CPI reports, and they've jacked interest rates up to five or six percent. And has the financial media ever mentioned that the required reserves ratio was lowered to zero percent in March of 2020? Zero percent, just like, <laughs> just like they probably did something egregious in March of 2023 with these banks, right? I mean, what about this, <laughs> right? You, you think this isn't going to affect people's lives if J.P. Morgan goes up here? <laughs> you know? Uh, this manufactured crisis and this manufactured solution, you know? And so the requ required reserves ratio was made 0% in March of 2020. Um and the Federal Reserve has a book called Modern Money Mechanics that within the first few pages says the number one thing controlling the money supply. Um, the uh, expansion of uh, deposits over the long term, over the long haul, over many, many years is the reserve requirement ratio. How much money are institutions required to have on hand that they can lend against? Okay, in that book, it says 10%. For some institutions, it was 3%. They lowered it to 0%. And in that book, it said that that ratio being it is the number one thing controlling monetary deposit expansion. And it is 0%. But they haven't had Jerome Powell answer questions about that. The financial media hasn't discussed this, you know? And so what they get to do now is they get to jack up interest rates. And so you have to borrow at ridiculous all-time high credit card rates for credit cards issued by a bank. The median rent past 2000 the percentage of income <laughs> required uh, for a mortgage, to pay a mortgage, rose to 60%. 60% of income is the average that's needed to make a mortgage payment, right? So they get to jack up these interest rates, not talk about the required reserves ratio, you know, invade countries, you know, <laughs> you know, and, right? Um, you know, and, and, and every month, right, we... What's the FOMC going to be? What's the CPI going to be? What's Jerome Powell going to say? He's not going to talk, you know, right? I made an 1,100% return on Pfizer using the exact same option screens that I used to tell you guys what was going to happen to oil. Perfect hits. Perfect hits. And that shouldn't be possible. That shouldn't be possible if it's a random walk. But I made an 1,100% return. On Pfizer options and that's that, that that funded a lot that funded a lot um, and I used the exact same screen to buy that that I used to tell you know hey they bought all these positions they're loading up straddles on oxy and XLE right and then a perfect hit on that that has affected everyone's life right and so Stocks are supposed to break my stops and crash. That's what they're there for. That's what that's the point. You know, that's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be dumb retail money, right? Y you know, there's not there's not supposed to be any instances where the length of wave one places the wave two is hit, places the wave two low is hit for wave three. And Starbucks and JP Morgan are both heading on these long term wave threes to, you know, 200. You know, or 200 in J.P. Morgan's case, it's 144 uh, for, for Starbucks, right? Um, you know, Bitcoin, like, this is going to affect people if this happens. It affected people when it happened in 2020 and 2021. 
Bitcoin was a perfect hit. A perfect hit. It's supposed to go break the stop. That's what it's there for. It's supposed to go break that $33,000 stop and spill out to wave C. That's what's supposed to happen. It's never supposed to enter a wave three of wave three and go up to 50, 60,000 and stop at 30,000 along the way. And, and someone on the internet with a, a dog profile isn't supposed to say that that's exactly what's going to happen. And it uncannily does, <laughs> you know? And so if Bitcoin does go wave one, wave two, wave three. And JP Morgan just went wave one, wave two, wave three, you know? And who knows what in-phase energy and, you know, Tesla's entering wave three or wave three is going to be explained with, right? Hopefully it's just, you know, some corporate stuff, acquisitions, you know, Elon tweeted something, right? Well, what if it's an energy crisis? Or, you know, what if, what if you know, Bitcoin and JP Morgan are really about to enter wave three because they're about to do some fucked up shit to our, our money, our dollars. And they're going to say they're going to do the same thing they did with, you know, the jab. They're going to say, hey, you need, you, need to get, you need to get on this Fed coin now. We, we're using blockchain now. Or... You know, hey, there's going to be a real banking crisis this time with like one bank and then JP Morgan's going to buy them. And that's why crypto's up at, you know, 70,000. I don't know. I hope it's all crazy. Right. But it happens. It happened with it. It shouldn't happen ever. Right? It definitely shouldn't happen once a quarter. And there definitely shouldn't be quarters where it happens to six or seven stocks. You know, I mean, it shouldn't ever happen. Right. And if Ethereum and, and Bitcoin are hits again, if they're perfect hits, I have a funny feeling, you know, it's going to affect us all the way through this wave one, wave two, wave three cycle. Anyway, I don't mean to be an alarmist. I do think that we've seen Ethereum go wave one, wave two, wave one, wave two. And I also believe it's entering a wave three of wave three as well. So we'll see. I'm long BITO. I want to get into um, Ethereum. I'm not sure the best way to that Ethereum ETF kind of sucks. Um, but I do think that it's at the very least going to, you know, um, be great evidence uh, for Bitcoin bulls. I don't buy any of that, you know, nonsense that Bitcoin and Ethereum are competing. I'm sure there'll be some days where one outperforms and uh, they say that's why. That reminds me. Um, I think in this e-cash sector, you know, PayPal, Square Cash, um, not, um, you know, not entering wave three within this long term cycle yet. I think that Shopify is really starting to give a lot of evidence that at least it is. And I, I really don't see, you know, the correlations killed the cat. But um, if Shopify goes one, two, three, four, five, wave one, wave two. And uh, that happens to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, ultimately, the bulls are going to argue that Shopify is entering the long-term wave three um, towards and even beyond this all-time high. Um, that's uh, and, and if that happens with Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, it's very likely that it, it happens uh, with PayPal and Shopify, in my opinion. And so what it's all kind of pointing to is... Um, you know, kind of, uh, yes, a resurgence of growth. So I didn't talk much about the value as much as I wanted to. Uh, I didn't, you know, I, I did talk a lot about my risk management, um, fortunately. And I do, you know, a lot of what I do is investing in low beta stocks, you know, stocks that pay uh, high, div high dividends. I've looked at um, some of these industrial real estate stocks recently, um, but I'm probably just going to end up posting about them. Um, this INDS, industrial real estate sector, um, Prolegis is the, is the top holding with this, but I think that a lot of these real estate stocks, I think IYR, I already have, I have one of these ETFs marked up, but XLO, XLRE, um, IYR, uh, the main idea is that this real estate sector um, formed a large wave one, one, um, and, and ended wave two uh, at this 61.8% retracement. Um, so that's the, uh, idea is that we could see a resurgence in the real estate sector, uh, 22.50, um, 22.50 and 
6.52. Uh, I'm not going to make them exact, but the, the main idea is that um, for a lot of these real estate stocks, and this is I N uh, D U S, the industrial real estate component. Um, the idea is that um, we're going to see uh, real estate uh, recover. I own Simon Property Group. Um, I'm interested uh, in this ETF and its top holding prolegis. Um, I own um, Medical Property uh, Group, MPW. I own Mort, M O R T. Uh, and I'm managing that with um, a straddle for the 10 strike uh, on AG and C uh, for further explorations. But um, if we see real estate go any lower, I'm going to be very interested in buying um, more of these uh, real estate stocks. And um, I think we're going to see a long term wave three uh, enter in this sector as well.